Adaima, la nécropole prédynastique. Depuis plusieurs décennies, la découverte d'une nécropole composée de plusieurs centaines de tombes, datant de 3600 à 2900 avant Jésus-Christ, intrigue les spécialistes de l'Égypte antique. Cette nécropole, située en Haute-Égypte, au sud de la ville de Luxor, est liée à une population contemporaine des premières dynasties égyptiennes. Les fouilles de la nécropole d'Adaïma ont été effectuées sur la zone Habitat ainsi que sur la zone Nécropole. La zone Nécropole est divisée entre le cimetière de la zone Ouest, plus ancien, qui a été partiellement pillé et ravagé au fil des siècles, et la partie Est, qui a subi quelques pillages, mais dont des dizaines de tombes sont restées intactes. Cette partie Est du cimetière est la plus récente. Et comme le note l'archéologue Eric Krubesi, en page 38 de son article « La nécropole d'Adaïma, une première synthèse » dans la revue Archéonil numéro 8, datant de l'année 1998. Citation « Le cimetière de l'Est est plus récent. Il se rapporte à une période où les deux premières dynasties étaient déjà en place. » Grâce à l'étude de cette nécropole, nous avons pu en apprendre sur les rites funéraires des populations et la manière dont elles enterraient leurs morts. Des cas de ce qui ressemblait à des tentatives de momification sont aussi détectés dans le compte-rendu de Hadaïma II, la nécropole prédynastique, dont au moins une avec des bordelettes. Une toilette funéraire était pratiquée sur le défunt, que l'on parait ensuite de bracelets en cuivre, avant de le placer dans des jarres, des cercueils en argile ou, pour les notables, des cercueils en bois. Dans la revue Archéonil numéro 8, page 105, L'article de l'égyptologue Stan Hendricks précise que « Finalement, les inhumations en jarre de la première et deuxième dynastie, telles qu'elles ont été trouvées à Adaïma, peuvent être considérées comme les prédécesseurs directs des tombes semblables attestées fréquemment dans des cimetières de l'Ancien Empire. » Quelle était l'origine de ces populations prédynastiques Ce sont les chercheurs de l'IFAO, l'Institut français d'archéologie orientale qui ont effectué les fouilles dans la nécropole, tout comme dans l'habitat de ces populations. En 2016, un article du site de l'INRAP, l'Institut National de Recherche Archéologique Préventive, un organisme officiel de la République française, qui est sous la tutelle du ministère de la Culture, assure que les populations prédynastiques de la nécropole d'Adaïma étaient des Africains d'origine subsaharienne. Citation. D'après les analyses morphologiques, la population inhumée l'une des plus anciennes de la vallée, se rapproche de celle d'Afrique subsaharienne, bien différente de toutes celles déjà étudiées, ce qui pose la question de la succession des populations dans la vallée du Nil au cours du temps. L'archéologue et paléanthropologue biologique Eric Krubesi a participé aux campagnes de fouilles d'Adaïma, qui ont eu lieu en plusieurs fois, étendues sur plusieurs années. Dans un article de 2010 intitulé « Le peuplement de la vallée du Nil », il écrit « Il est notamment impossible pour les fouilles anciennes de savoir quelle partie de population répartie sur quel laps de temps ils représentent. Dans ce contexte, l'étude de la population du cimetière Est d'Adaïma prendra toute sa valeur. En effet, il s'agit d'un cimetière d'enfants bien conservé. Les couronnes dentaires de la denture définitive sont en place, mais non usées, incluses dans l'os pour la plupart. Et la durée du cimetière, comme sa représentativité par rapport à la population générale, sont de mieux en mieux cernés. L'une des particularités de la population d'Adaïma, mise en évidence lors d'une étude préliminaire, est l'importante fréquence des canines supérieures dites « Bushmen », qui présente une variation anatomique très fréquente dans certaines populations africaines, notamment les Khoisan. L'origine africaine de la population, déjà largement soupçonnée, est là, confirmée. <rire>
Eric Crubesi signale l'importance de ces découvertes réalisées ces dernières années, puisque selon lui, elles font voler en éclat le consensus sur l'origine des anciens Égyptiens. Il note « Les populations contemporaines de la vallée ne peuvent plus être considérées aussi facilement qu'on avait pu l'envisager autrefois, comme les descendantes directes des populations dynastiques. En effet, l'époque historique semble avoir conduit à des arrivées de sujets ainsi qu'à des choix matrimoniaux bien distincts entre communautés religieuses. Dans le livre « Adaïma II, la nécropole prédynastique », Eric Crubesi et ses confrères ont fait un travail énorme en répertoriant et détaillant le contenu de dizaines de tombes sur les 300 à 400 premières pages de l'ouvrage. Ce monumental travail a permis de connaître approximativement l'âge, le sexe, la taille, l'usure des dents, voire les maladies qui ont pu frapper les membres de cette communauté. On a remarqué un dimorphisme sexuel assez prononcé chez cette population, c'est-à-dire que les différences de taille entre les hommes et les femmes étaient de l'ordre de 15 cm. Mais une tombe a particulièrement attiré l'attention des scientifiques. C'est la S100. De constitution très solide, l'homme qui était enterré dans cette tombe semblait être d'un niveau social très élevé et culminait à une taille située entre 1m85 et 1m90, ce qui pour l'époque est extraordinairement grand. Qui sont ces hommes de grande taille et d'où venaient-ils Sur la base des analyses scientifiques pluridisciplinaires amassées par son équipe, Eric Crubesi explique à la page 530 que ces populations sont des populations typiquement africaines, nées en Afrique et issues d'un environnement typiquement nilotique. Citation Adaima, une population africaine. Les reconstitutions de la stature ont montré que la population d'Adaima se rapprochait plus des séries de références africaines qu'européennes. Certaines données retrouvées à Adaima sont en fait le propre de la plupart des populations nilotiques, quelles que soient les époques, du néolithique à l'époque moderne. L'étude d'Adaïma a permis de remettre en cause beaucoup de croyances en ce qui concerne l'Égypte ancienne. On était par exemple persuadé, écrit Eric Crubesi, que l'écriture hiéroglyphique était apparue soudainement en Égypte sous l'influence de la Mésopotamie. Adaïma vient nous rappeler que si cette écriture est bien apparue à la fin du prédynastique, en réalité, sa conceptualisation s'est étalée sur près de 1000 ans et que ces populations y ont parfaitement contribué. Une question se pose, est-ce si étonnant d'apprendre cela En vérité, non. Nous savons depuis des années que ce sont bien des peuples africains qui sont à l'origine du site archéologique de Napta Playa, dans lequel on étudiait l'astronomie plusieurs siècles avant l'avènement de la première dynastie égyptienne. Pour illustrer ces preuves, voici quelques extraits qui relatent tous ces travaux sur l'émergence de la civilisation égyptienne par des populations africaines. And what, they would, what would happen is that during a two or three weeks period, they would drench the Sahara. And in the depressions, of course, they would form temporary lakes. It's beautiful pastoral field, you know. Now, because of that, the nomads 
of the area. Now we don't know where they came from, but there's a very strong case now that they came from the Tibesti Mountains in the, in the Chad. A long, long time ago. They were black people. They, were, they, they looked like Maasai, it's very, very slender, very beautiful black people. We don't know when they came, maybe 20, 30,000 years ago. Something drove them into what is today the Sahara. So, my beginning comment here, uh, ancient Africa, ancient Egypt was in Africa. We can't really doubt that, can we? Uh, it's in the continent. But more important, ancient Egypt was of Africa. And that, of course, is not the way uh, the past two centuries of Western scholarship have generally presented its history. Uh, it's long past time, I would say, for all of us to discard a whole set of old notions about Egypt, notions rooted uh, in really the self-serving racialist presumptions of 19th century Europeans, notions that only too often people even today simply assume they've never thought to examine those ideas. They're back in the background informing our minds even when we're not aware they are. And on the historical and the scholarly level, that re-examination uh, is underway. Uh, the most recent, maybe we should generation, maybe we should say generations, the last 30 years or so, of scholars and scholarship on Nubia and Egypt are bringing together a whole new body, uh, and maybe I should say whole new bodies of evidence, revealing the African rootedness of pre-dynastic and early dynastic Egyptian culture. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring the prehistoric origins in Black Africa of ancient Egyptian culture. My guest is Professor Thomas Brophy, who is the president of the California Institute of Human Science. He has authored several books on this subject, including The Origin Map, Prehistoric Megalithic Astrophysical Maps of the Universe, and two books co-authored with Robert Uval, Black Genesis, The Prehistoric Origins of Ancient Egypt, and Imhotep the African, Architect of the Cosmos. He is also author of a wonderful book called The Mechanism Demands a Mysticism, Explorations of Spirit, Matter, and Physics. There were a few early voices that rejected the notion of Egypt as a Near Eastern civilization. Writing in 1911, E.A. Wallace Budge drew similarities between drew on African ethnography to inform his understanding of ancient Egyptian religion, seeing similarities with contemporary practices among Nilotic cultures as evidence for an indigenous Northeast African origin, like the Dinka here, particularly cattle symbolism. But I'm, I'm somewhat unorthodox in e e amongst Egyptologists in that I very strongly feel, and maybe it's my perspective from the South, that ancient Egypt is an African civilization fundamentally, fundamentally different from Near Eastern civilizations. And you can really see it if you look at the institution of kingship, the symbols, and especially coming out of a deep past during the Neolithic. So we tend to look at Egypt as it is today and when we think about the origins of Egyptian civilization. But the ecology was completely different. The Sahara was a vast grassland with pastoral nomads running out. It's the earliest domestication of cattle um, and a very sophisticated culture, uh, a very sophisticated culture that was in interaction with, you know, it was part of a larger cult cattle complex. And you, when you look at the different practices that come into Egypt, you see that's the fundamental core. And, and Henry Frankfurt recognized this in the 1940s, talking about an African substratum to Egyptian civilization. And more recent work, as we know more and more about this, suggests that Egypt is coming out of those traditions. And that's where you see the cattle elements in Egyptian civilization too. The, you know, the, the king wears a bull's tail, for example. Hathor is a, a preeminent uh, fertility goddess. Uh, the Wa scepter, which is actually uh, a dried bull's penis, it's still used as a symbol in some uh, Nilotic cattle pastoralists. So here we are, we have a people who were navigating the desert, who finally, finally found themselves at this Napta Playa, only a hundred kilometers from the Nile, six, seven thousand years before the Pharaoh, stayed there. And the reason they stayed there is that suddenly it clicked to them that they didn't have to move. They began to dig deep wells and they stayed. So in the dry season they would have water from the wells and then the rain would come and replenish. So they stayed for thousands of years. 
and the, rest, the, the navigation and astronomy became more religious. They still practiced the astronomy, they became more and more religious, hence why well, there's all these strange ceremonial sites. So here we have the roots of a complex culture who knew about who knew about to move stones, who had domesticated cattle, who were practicing basic uh, agriculture, we found cereal grows, thousands of years before the pharaohs appeared. Uh, by the way, this is just going off here for a second. Uh, some of you may have seen or heard about a recent genetics article that makes uh, the ancient Egyptians out to be Levantines. Uh, let me be very clear, these findings come from one locale in a large stretch of possible locales in northern Egypt and the finds date well after the foundational periods of, of uh, ancient Egypt. It's somewhat as if, I was thinking of this particular image, rather than investigating DNA uh, from a 17th century cemetery in Plymouth, we instead choose to investigate DNA from a later 19th century cemetery in South Boston. And then we conclude, having done that, that the United States was founded by people of Irish descent, <laughs> and that Americans were predominantly are, are predominantly Irish. Yes, yeah, there are giraffes and animals like that depicted in the rock art, and uh, we uh, went there to visit a uh, a beautifully painted prehistoric cave that uh, was discovered in that region, uh, just discovered in 2007. We went there, we were the second group uh, to go there in 2008. We went with uh, the discoverer of the cave. It has on the ceiling very beautiful uh, prehistoric rock art depicting the people who lived there and their raising of cattle and various uh, domestic scenes and that sort of thing. We're talking about black Africans. Yes. Yes. In, in this area. As I understand it, Egyptian archaeologists have, and Egypt, Egyptologists have uh, largely suggested that the ancient Egyptian culture in, developed independently of black Africa. That's sort of the conventional <laughs> viewpoint. Yes, that's sort of the conventional view mm -hmm. that, that had been uh, uh, that had been followed. Uh, and recently, though, it is changing because, as you mentioned, uh, related to the find of the uh, uh, art, the rock art in that region, uh, there was also found, actually by the same people, a, uh, a hieroglyph, a uh, hieroglyph uh, with a cartouche, the name of a, a Middle Kingdom king, Egyptian uh, pharaoh, and uh, that uh, really changed uh, ideas in this regard because the area is now and has been since 3000 BC, so extreme desert, uh, it was assumed there was no uh, travel to that area mm -hmm. from even, even uh, dynastic times of ancient Egypt. First of all, we know also, also from the ancient uh, inscription that the Egyptian, we have different race that were part of this Egyptian uh, um, culture and nation. So we have one that is from the Delta, Lower Egypt. They were more short and curly, more like the Yemenite, if you want. Mm -hmm. And we have another race of the ancient Egyptian coming from the upper uh, side of Egypt, lower from the Delta. We call it the Upper Egypt. They are more like uh, Dexter. They are more like Sudan, tall. Um, I would say black, you know, that... Uh now, the climate changes again. The desert becomes more and more arid and the Nile becomes more and more habitable. The floods become gentle, and these people literally were forced to move. They had to move out of the Sahara. And the obvious place they went is the Nile. Well, that isn't necessarily how the uh, writers of the article meant it to be interpreted, but that's certainly the way I've had people interpreting it to me. Even someone with a Coptic seemed to be a Coptic last name from the sounds of things, uh, berating me for being such a terrible human being all these years of my whole career, forever having thought of Egypt as being African. So, anyway. And this was understood by, at, le at least by the ancient Greeks, probably by the ancient Persians, but 
uh, maybe the ancient Sumerians who were uh, students of astrology. What your findings suggest, if I understand it, that the procession of the equinoxes was understood by these prehistoric uh, people in black Africa who created these particular megaliths, uh, uh, like an astronomical calendar, sometimes called the uh, Stonehenge of the Sahara. Yes, uh, the Naptoplaya find was announced uh, by CNN as the Stonehenge of the Sahara. And uh, it's a fascinating site. It does have megaliths. And uh, however, the, the calendar circle that uh, got a lot of attention uh, was composed of, is composed of uh, smaller stones. They come up to about your knee. But they are in, they, that forms a very interesting calendar circle, which has a st astronomical meaning. Uh, and that calendar circle is in the complex of uh, megalithic large stone uh, structures and alignments as well. Mm -hmm. now, do we know anything at all about the people who created these structures? Uh, yes, uh, uh, we know they were black African uh, people. Their remains are studied anthropologically and they were the people uh, inhabiting the region of, of the time. Mm -hmm. I understand that they also seem to have uh, some sort of religious cult involving uh, uh, the ceremonial um, rituals uh, that had to do with the, uh, the cow. The cow was very important to them. Yes, uh, the cattle cult and uh, the, uh, the uh, serious and uh, the cattle iconography was very important to them uh, as well as uh, in uh, ancient Egypt, which came later, yeah. ancient Egyptian civilization. And at Nepta Playa, there were not found any uh, graves of humans. No human uh, kings or leaders' uh, graves were found, but a very finely uh, constructed grave of a cow was mm -hmm. found. Uh, which is so something similar to uh, what you will find in ancient Egypt. Yes. Where, like the Serapium, where there's a, a whole large, enormous complex with uh, emb embalmed bulls. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There, so there are many elements, clearly, of the culture that was operating at Nabta Playa in the earlier time that moved to the Nile Valley and uh, became the uh, ancient Egyptian dynastic civilization. But I think you have to see Egypt as an African civilization. And you know, some of my colleagues tell me, well, why does it, you know, it doesn't really matter anyway. And I say, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, it's, absolutely. Uh, it, it, it defeats racism. It, ultimately, it, it defeats racism because you can't have a civilization like Egypt or Nubia as well. I mean, Reisner went to great lengths to try and make Nubian civilization not African. And, and people called him out on it. Even that early Juncker, for example, criticized his characterization of Kerma as a kind of colony. Uh, but... Uh, but I mean, it defeats racism. You can't say an inferior people built the pyramids and created Egyptian civilization. So I think it's important to make that statement. Anyway, so another arresting body of archaeological evidence exists relating to the ancient sharing of ritual and belief across this culture area. In the fifth millennium BCE, Nabta, you can find that if you look on the map, it's between kind of off to the west, uh, south of the first cataract. 200 kilometers, 250 kilometers southwest of Aswan. This was a major ritual center with astronomically oriented megalithic arrays. There is a huge consensus here. I mean, there is m most anthropologists now, and uh, most senior Egyptologists are accepting that there was a mistake that the origins of the pharaoh, there was two theories, that either they came from the Asiatic and Levant side, the yeah. Mediterranean, or that they sprouted themselves, I mean it just happened. Well now, the evidence is pointing entirely in a different direction, it's pointing to the west, to the sub-Saharan region, and even further, we think that the people that we're talking about came from probably the Chad and these areas. Now the reason is that these areas were very, very inviting for human beings. You know, the, the Tibesti Mountains are superb places for human beings to flourish, whereas the other places were very agitated. So, the whole picture is changing. There is a bias, of course. There is a bias because there is established theories, there is established books, and the big bias is going to come from 
from the those who have a difficulty in, 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 in stomaching the idea that civilization, the roots of civilization is from a black people from the sub-Saharan. You know, and, and uh, we've suspected this for a long time. Uh, but there is a problem, there's an ethic problem here. The Egyptians, uh, the historians have a problem. We, we, we attribute all our knowledge to the Greeks. We attribute our knowledge to some sort of um, Greek super invention. You know, whereas we know the Egyptians had the architecture, astronomy, and mathematics before them, and now we know that the sub-Saharan people had this before them. This bias was illustrated in a modern scientific context by a recent DNA study in Nature Communications that received a great deal of press, unfortunately. They concluded that the foundational population of ancient Egypt was related not to other Africans, but rather to Middle Eastern peoples, contradicting modern genetic studies of contemporary Egyptians. They go on to posit that Modern genetic ties between Egyptians and other Africans came with the medieval Arab slave trade. Nature's own publicity for this piece uh, reflects how deeply embedded this assumption is, even in the academy. And here it is here. Uh, and you know, we here we have someone saying how nice it is that this study now provided empirical evidence uh, for this assumption at the genetic level, without even realizing that this completely begs uh, the question. The study was fundamentally flawed. The authors overgeneralized to all of the Egyptian, all of Egyptian history from a sample of only 90 individuals from a single poorly documented cemetery in northern Egypt, only three with a full genome. The burials date to the latest periods of Egyptian history, so how you extrapolate then back to the very dawn of Egyptian civilization is uh, puzzling at best. And all but three or four, in the, all but three or four individuals came from after 1000 BCE. They did not include any individuals from southern Egypt or Nubia, something they admit as a weakness only at the very end of the article. So today in Egypt, uh, the archaeologists uh, often refer to, and, and I've been there, uh, to connections between ancient Egyptian culture and the Sumerian culture and the Crete culture and the Persian culture. Uh, Yet when you visit Egypt, especially uh, around the Aswan in the southern uh, part of the Nile, you see uh, uh, mostly black people. Yes, yeah, and uh, uh, we know from the anthropological evidence that the people uh, just predating the uh, dynastic civilization in the Na in the Naptapaya region were were black uh, black mm -hmm. African people. In 1948, he argued that in order to understand Egyptian kingship and religion, one should use the ethnography of the, and I quote, groups of people who are the true survivors of the, that great East African substratum out of which Egyptian culture arose, end quote. In contrast to most Egyptologists, even today, he saw any Near Eastern influence on Egypt's origins as ultimately superficial and adaptive, and I quote, we observe that Egypt in a period of intensified creativity became acquainted with the achievements of Mesopotamia, that it was stimulated, and that it adapted to its own rapid development such elements as seemed compatible with its efforts. It mostly transformed what it had borrowed, and after a time rejected even these modified derivations. And, and so many Egyptians today who probably think of themselves primarily as Mediterranean people, uh, even though they're on the African continent, uh, look down at the idea that their very powerful ancient culture might have emerged out of black Africa. Yeah, and it's it's clearly obviously a modern uh, ethnic view or ethnic mindset mm -hmm. that, that leads to that kind of thinking, it, not any evidence from ancient history, mm -hmm. I don't think. So